everyone. It's lovely to be here. I'm going to try out my clicker because I have a, a fiendish time with these things. Excellent. <laughs> um, so today I'm talking about beyond accuracy. Um, and really I'm talking about uh, the other desirable properties that we um, believe we should constrain our model function to learn. Um, a little, I, I believe a lot of my background was captured in the introduction. Uh, my area of research is um, primarily recently being how do we develop protocols for understanding whether the interpretability methods that we use are reliable. Um, right now, I'm working on model compression, which is really getting at this idea that these models, uh, for various reasons, firstly, we want to understand whether there's, a more whether there's a more compact representation that is just as sufficient. But secondly, uh, compressed models are both um, uh, less memory as well as lower latency. So it's very exciting as a research area for um, models on the edge. But today I'll be talking primarily about uh, my research on interpretability. Um, I, I work on research at Google Brain. Um, my parents are self-described hippies, so I grew up in many places around uh, Africa. They now live in Liberia, but I grew up primarily in Mozambique. Um, they, uh, I will actually be moving closer to them later this year. I will be joining the new Google Accra AI lab. Um, so I want to start with a question, uh, which is, Put your hand up if you believe that models should be, are required to be interpretable. Okay, healthy. I feel like David primed you well for this question. Um, and what about, put your hand up if you believe that models should be required to be fair. I see, nuanced, and people are like trying to hedge question to question. Um, what about robust to adversarial examples? Excellent. Now here is a question. Put up your hand if you are certain that your definition of what an interpretable model looks like is the same as your neighbor. It's tricky. <laughs> And that's really what we're going to get into today. Um, I'm going to motivate uh, some of the examples by anchoring it to computer vision, both because this is the first uh, breakthrough in deep neural networks that has translated to uh, wide deployment, as well as because a lot of research on uh, the nuances of how do we incorporate these other desirable properties has centered on computer vision. Um, and I'm going to firstly talk about the progress um, uh, of where we are in the task, and then I'm going to ask, what do we mean by interpretability? And more specifically, how do we even measure progress on this task? Um, so it'll be fun. I tend to include ideas that I'm thinking about as I put the slides together. So I might uh, have a crisp pace and then moderate as I go, because I don't know if I've quite calibrated well for time. But let's get started. <laughs> so going beyond accuracy, uh, really the, the, the kickoff for <laughs> computer vision is normally uh, pinpointed to this fairly um, uh, perhaps overly ambitious summer project uh, at the MIT AI lab uh, where a group of undergraduates were told to connect uh, a camera to a computer and teach the computer to see the world the way that humans do. This is, of course, after the introduction of the pixel in the 19, late 1950s. And 1956, of course, was the, the very beginning, where it was the meeting in Dartmouth where we are going to impart to models the ability to uh, do perform tasks normally reserved for humans. And so this was very exciting. Um, the summer did not quite have the promising results that were expected. Um, but essentially, there was a huge uh, energy around research in the, this area and continues to be for the next few decades. Um, and computer vision translated into different tasks. And today I'll talk about really um, object classification, uh, the tasks that we've done the best on so far. Uh, and this is a tricky task for a few different reasons. Uh, one is the dimensionality of the data set. Uh, 
if you take a 299 by 299 um, uh, three-channel image, you're looking at a quarter of a million features for each image in your data, data set. And so frankly, a lot of uh, the initial approaches were about how do you reduce this dimensionality. And still, a lot of what a deep neural network is doing is extracting um, a useful, sufficient representation that is informative for the task, but reducing the dimensionality uh, significantly. Uh, the other reason is this, that simply we're very good at computer vision. Uh, we have the ability to uh, remember uh, an innumerable amount of human faces. Uh, we're also very robust to variations that frequently derail neural networks. So things like variational, var variation, variance in standpoint, in illumination, in background clutter. Um, it's a very hard benchmark to beat. Um, and some of the most promising results uh, early on, and this is, you know, in, in, for the discourse we're talking about today, this has been treated like a supervised learning problem. Some of the most promising advances were actually in the 2000s. So in the 2000s, there, was, there were essentially um, uh, human engineered features that were encoding properties of the image um, so that you could at the end have a linear classifier. Um, and these could be quite simple, like you could th think of it as like a histogram of the pixels. But there was actually fairly powerful ones uh, for narrow tasks. <laughs> so there was a flurry of activity, and I, I think it's uh, important to remember that some of these were doing based on human do domain knowledge, translating how we extract certain features, um, and then at the end, do classification. The issue is, is that it was a multi-step pipeline. Uh, you are perhaps, well, clearly um, overfitting to certain tasks. Uh, it didn't generalize well. Uh, and so the real breakthrough was in 2012. Um, and that was kind of the foray, the introduction of convolutional neural networks. Um, and that was the a group from Toronto University um, entered an algorithm called Supervision that just blew everything else out of the water. Um, and so that was like a clear turning point because everyone ditched uh, these human and crafted, um, very powerful but very narrow feature selection and opted in for a single differentiable pipeline where we've given up, relinquished our power to understand what is happening at every step of the process, but we arrive at a much more powerful representation. Um, so, <laughs> in some ways, we're very happy. We've, we've seen huge progress um, uh, as we measure by test set accuracy. Um, however, in some ways, we're clearly not quite satisfied. And there appears to be looming uh, concern in our discourse about how we think about the implications of these models. And, and that's often... Uh, I, I hear talk about interpretability uh, related discourse, but in fact, there's various areas in which we feel that our optimization process, and we know that the way that we optimize these models uh, and the way that we evaluate performance using test accuracy may not embody all the properties that we care about. Uh, and this can include model compression, interpretability, fairness, adversarial robustness. Um, and here I, here I think it's uh, interesting to go into each, but really for the rest of the talk, I want to lead us through uh, thinking about interpretability. Um, and really, I, I'm hoping that we grapple with not just what it means to be interpretable, um, but also, do we ever know if we're at the finish line? <laughs> um, my talk is a little grumpy at times, and uh, perhaps that's because uh, I think it's very nuanced as a topic. And uh, as we try and reflect upon how we as a community push it forward, um, it's, it's, it's hard to say that this is clearly interpretable and this is clearly not. So a lot of this will be introducing some of the nuances that I've been thinking about. Um, Motivation. So there's frequently uh, uh, various motivations put forward for why we should care about interpretability. Uh, one is this idea of the self-driving car example. There's some tasks that we, we absolutely must 
be able to explain the model performance. There's also a very natural desire for interpretability as you iterate to deploy a model. How can you anticipate uh, harm before you deploy, or retroactively explain unintended harm. Um, there's also, frankly, scientific curiosity. A lot of interpretability, uh, the first sensitivity heat maps, which are gradient heat maps, were from researchers trying to understand why their models were not trained. Uh, and so I think a, a core motivation is still us grappling with how do we iterate and how do we understand fundamentally what's happening. Um, key takeaway is that we would always love interpretability. What I will suggest is that um, there's a spectrum in how we want to weigh interpretability. Uh, and that may be influenced by various things, uh, but key are the task and the role, the vantage point of you as a person or whoever is the end, uh, end recipient of the explanation. And why does task matter? Task matters because, uh, frankly, some domains are much more sensitive than others. Domains that affect human welfare, like credit scoring or self-driving cars or healthcare, where an incorrect prediction can have a clear adverse impact on human welfare, those are uh, definitely tasks where we should require stronger constraints on how a model performs. Um, uh, however, Historical performance also is part of this, uh, because if we have strong empirical uh, data about how a model has performed in various different settings, um, in some cases that may give us uh, more certainty about the, the variance, at least, in performance. Um, and so partly, uh, I sense that in some of these areas, we will have a shifting understanding of what what we expect in terms of interpretability, mainly because uh, input output, understanding that pattern over different, over both time and different variations, uh, may compensate for some of our lack of uh, clear, crisp explanations. Um, this is, of course, depends uh, again on the sensitive domain. Oh, and then trade off. So this is fun because I think that. Often, uh, it was very funny, I got an email a few weeks ago and someone said, I don't get this. Why don't, why don't people just release the weights of their model? <laughs> um, and I thought that was very interesting because yes, it feels like this very decisive, let's do this, this is the solution. Um, uh, in fact, like, it may introduce other trade-offs that we're not anticipating. So if we release, release the weights of the, the model, there could be implications for privacy or for security, because you've essentially given people much more access. Um, so that's also important to consider. Um, I also, this is perhaps um, the most tricky thing about this problem, is that how useful an explanation is will very much depend upon uh, the vantage point um, of what you need to do with this information. <laughs> Uh, so, for example, yesterday I flew in from California, um, but perhaps everyone has this experience where you're um, on a plane and you're told, oh, um, there's a, there's a uh, technical issue, we're, we're, we're resolving it, we should be underway in 15 minutes. So that's what we, that's what we hear in the cheap seats. But like, essentially, like the pilot is having a much more sophisticated discourse, um, and the the technical staff on the ground is having a perhaps even more nuanced discourse. Um, and those are all. Um, it's not clear that we would benefit from a more technical discourse. It might even make us more uneasy. <laughs> Um, and, and so there is this very interesting idea that uh, the degree of explainability required uh, is what, what is required for it to be actionable for the person who's using the information. Um, and this may also ver like, uh, impact the tools that we choose to develop. So for example, as a researcher, um, I am interested in the explanation of a single example. Like, why did a model make a prediction about this example this way? But I'm fascinated by understanding the distribution of the data set. Like, I really want to know what are outliers? What are, what are prototypes in my data set? What does the model get to know very well? And these are like open research questions. Whereas a doctor um, or the end consumer, definitely the end consumer is always going to want to know for their data point, why did the model make this decision? And these are different directions, perhaps not different, but it's not quite clear. Like, uh, an explanation for one example doesn't give you an understanding of the global function. Um, so it's inherently subjective, as perhaps we hinted at earlier when 
uh, we know we want it, but we also don't know what the other person uh, thinks that it is. Or perhaps we don't even quite know if we know what we, what, when we would be happy saying we've arrived. I want to uh, introduce to, to get into really uh, the topic that I've been thinking about a lot, uh, which is how to measure progress. I want to introduce some of the ways that uh, the work that people are currently doing. Um, so interpreting, my focus is deep neural networks. Um, and there's various different approaches to this. Most presume that our starting point is a trained network. So we say, hey, this is trained. We've optimized prioritizing uh, test set accuracy. Let's now uh, think about what we, how we can interpret. Um, so there's model distillation, where a teacher model imparts upon the student model, um, which is more interpretable but constrains accuracy. Uh, there's human vantage point investigation. So this is uh, visualization. Uh, it's also uh, work from my collaborator, uh, Bean, and, and many other people from Brain. Um, it's concept vector activations. Um, and then this was hinted at, I believe, David profiled work um, which is really getting at this, which is like, how do we estimate the role and function of neurons? So can we say that this is a neuron doing a specific um, feature extraction? Um, and then there's also uh, estimating the importance of input pixels. Can we say what subset of pixels was most important for prediction? So given this, how do we measure progress? Uh, particularly given many different methods that are trying to do the same thing. So these are all methods that try and estimate what subset of pixels are important. How do we choose? Um, I really, we want a method to fulfill two criteria. One is that it should be meaningful to a human, um, meaning that we should gain information from it. Um, uh, the second, which is trickier, is it should be an accurate reflection of the model. It should be reliable, because if not, why are we here? Um, and measuring whether it's meaningful does not ensure that it's also reliable. And this is key, and this has been the subject of my research, is showing that explanations considered meaningful have these very unexpected failure points. Um, and we must guarantee reliability because um, an unreliable explanation is actually kind of misinformation. We don't know anything about the model, and then we learn an incorrect uh, explanation of the model, especially for sensitive domains that's per perhaps even more precarious. Uh, so the tricky thing is, is that how do you measure reliability when you have no ground truth? Because if we knew what was actually important, we wouldn't really be doing this in the first place. So the research uh, that I've been working on with my collaborators, and I'll also mention another paper which I think is quite exciting, uh, defines these edge cases, which, where it, it's essentially cases where we expect a certain behavior. So the first is that we hope that an interpretability method that's estimating importance does so better than a random guess. Um, and so to assess that, uh, the work that I did uh, in Remove and Retrain with my collaborators essentially removed the pixels that are estimated to be most important, and we trained the network. And the expectation is, is that the network should degrade accuracy more for the method than for just randomly removing pixels. Um, because if it's accurate, it should be able to select the, mo the, the pixels that um, are most important to the network to begin with. Um, the second uh, edge case, which I thought was a really fun piece of work, was essentially working off the statement that um, if an interpolability method should be sensitive to factors that do impact the model. So this is work by uh, Julius Abdayo and a few other people. Um, and really what it does is it randomizes progressively the network. And so the network is, is complete garbage at this point. Um, and, but the, the explanations themselves hardly vary, um, which is fascinating. Uh, and then the last case that I'll, I'll, I'll mention, and then um, I'll, I'll share some parting thoughts, is that um, if the model does not change, uh, the method should not. Um, and uh, in this work, uh, we showed that common preprocessing steps, so like just applying a constant vector shift, um, could both uh, create entirely new explanations, 
but also if you knew those failure points, you could purposely manipulate the explanation. So uh, in this case, we show that you can manipulate some of these interpretability methods to explain an MNIST digit as a, a kitty cat. Um, so uh, I shared a few things today. Uh, perhaps they are useful. Um, I, I shared really this idea that uh, interpretability is always something that we, we want. Um, but uh, the degree that we place weight on it, particularly the, uh, as versus test set performance, um, how we weigh these criteria will depend upon various factors. Um, the second is that uh, when we do require it, we must ensure that it's both meaningful and reliable. Um, and this uh, is an iterative process uh, that will involve uh, finding failure points and fixing them and moving uh, forward. And then the, set, the third is that, um, oh, perhaps the third is related to the second, but <laughs> um, I, these formal definitions are a way to also make us more precise as a community and also to, to perhaps at least hold us accountable for what we mean when we say, let's have explainability or let's have interpretability. Because you may not agree with the formal definitions that I put forward, but at least, I, at least then we have a discourse um, to really try and measure progress or where we don't make progress. Um, so with that, um, I'll, I'll finish. Thank you.